Hello, my name is Jeffrey Wolf. I have the honor and privilege of moderating and welcoming you to this first of a three-part series on green financing. This series is organized by Holland and Knight in association with the University of Miami School of Law. For purposes of this series, we will use the phrase green financing in its widest possible sense, credit for and investment in projects promoting improved environmental outcomes and sustainability. In that sense, green financing is becoming a central feature of US and international markets, climate change, mitigation related asset allocations and reallocations, and government, corporate, and social policy. Indeed, green financing actions, cues, and effects are literally ubiquitous. Uh, this morning, as I was jogging to clear my mind and think about the right words to say at the beginning, um, life was made easy as a uh, electric garbage truck passed me, written, be green, be clean on both sides. It's literally uh, everywhere. That ubiquity flows from an ever increasing, increasing recognition that climate change mitigation is in equal measure progressive and conservative, and that finance and investment lies as a practical matter at the center of action relating to it. Um, with all that as, as general background, uh, this series will look at the topic of green financing, um, its regulation and its implications in a wide sense. It will be a, a, a panoramic view of, uh, the next slide please, um, a panoramic view of the subject. Um, it will be intersectoral in the sense of looking at different industries and their relation and approach to it and interdisciplinary between law, um, uh, economics, government policy, and related disciplines. Um, the series uh, will have three, three sessions. This is the first. This first session is on reporting, calculating carbon emissions. There will be uh, two additional sessions at dates to be advised. Uh, the second on the criteria and regulation um, of and related to green financing. And the third will be social aspects of green financing. The next slide. Turning to today's session, um, reporting, calculating carbon emissions. We are going to uh, um, approach this, and we picked this topic on purpose because um, before getting into law and, and policy, we thought it appropriate to deal with the the questions of data and calculation, which are really the under undercarriage, the, 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 the basis of uh, environmental uh, aspects of ESG reporting. Uh, and this topic has probably been, been you know, not, has been, not focused on as much as, as others. Um, the data and calculation issues flow into, into reporting. Reporting itself, uh, it's again a broad term, but uh, reporting um, uh, on ESG and on emissions issues um, is done for, for various reasons. Um, and we've listed four here, uh, very, very general ones. The first, reporting is essential to internal and external policy communications uh, and compliance related issues. Second, reporting has financial impacts, uh, including uh, green and sustainability parameters. Third, reporting is central to regulatory compliance. And finally, reporting plays a critical role on social positions and corporate value signaling. Um, today, in this first session, we'll be looking at those data calculation reporting issues um, from um, a bank and investor perspective in light of regulatory trends, um, in light of uh, fast developing US government policy. And uh, we'll take a, a, a good hard look at some underlying foundational issues in the space of data and methodology, um, both generally and with a sectoral view. You see here a basic schematic. We're not going to be following this um, uh, closely, but this depicts 
the, the, the flows into and the structure of things leading to reporting. At the bottom, you'll see there's the question of, of, of data, which comes from uh, different sources with different cr criteria, um, flows into methods of calculation uh, and, and models and, 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 and metrics and benchmarks, which we'll be discussing, um, and then results in, in outputs driven by targets and used for the purposes of, of reporting. And those are the ideas that we'll be uh, working with uh, today. Next slide. We have a wonderful um, group uh, involved here, uh, panelists, um, and I'm going to introduce each of them when they speak in more, in more detail, um, but you see them here. Um, uh, we have um, Professor Caroline um, Bradley from the University of Miami uh, School of Law, you know, the Silva from the Bowen Company, um, um, various partners from Holland and Knight, Steve Humes, Mark Kaplan, uh, Laura Rice, uh, Jody Tenev, and Beth uh, Viola from Holland and Knight uh, policy side. We're also extremely happy to have uh, Jamie Martin from uh, Morgan Stanley, a more on whom in a moment, and Michael Parker, uh, the chairman of Global Shipping Logistics for, uh, for Citibank. Next slide. This is the structure of this uh, program and the timing. Uh, the first hour will be uh, focused on foundational issues, um, uh, starting with uh, current uh, uh, methods of bank and investor um, uh, reporting. Um, we'll move to regulatory uh, trends and implications, US government policy, and then the fundamental data issues. Um, after that, uh, we will take in the second hour the sectoral uh, assessment, uh, looking at shipping, aviation, power generation, real estate, and related items. Uh, before turning to the uh, first speaker, just uh, two practical notes. This session is being recorded. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you have uh, questions, please feel free to um, submit them through the Q&A function on your screens. Um, we may or may not have time to uh, to address those now, but uh, uh, to the extent that we don't, we will take them back and look at them um, and make a few comments at the beginning of the second session um, um, on those questions. So with that, um, uh, the floor will now be turned to uh, Jamie Martin um, to give our first uh, presentation. Jamie is the executive director in Morgan Stanley's Global Sustainability Finance Group. And he's responsible for delivering sustainability investment products and solutions to the firm's institutional and wealth management clients. Jamie's a leader in this space. Um, he is a former uh, representative on the executive committee of the Green <coughs> Bond uh, Principles, among many other things. Jamie started his career um, at Citibank um, in the Global Investment Research Group. He took his undergraduate degree from Colgate and his MBA from HEC Paris in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Jamie? Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. And uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, where, wherever you might be. Um, my job at the Global Sustainable Finance Group at Morgan Stanley uh, is really to work across uh, Morgan Stanley's three businesses, Institutional Securities Group, Investment Banking, Capital Market, Sales and Trading, Research, et cetera, Morgan Stanley Investment Management, our Global Asset Management Business, and Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, our uh, you know, distribution network uh, of nearly 16,000 financial advisors plus the recent acquisition of E-Trade. Um, Jeffrey asked me to come today to give a little perspective on how uh, climate and uh, strategy and considerations are evolving at Morgan Stanley uh, and other uh, global financial institutions. Um, this is you know, a complex um, issue come with lots of different layers and lots of different dynamics at play. I'm gonna go through these slides relatively quickly, but the idea is really to introduce uh, this group um, to some of the, the, the um, developments, some of the concepts, certainly some of the acronyms um, that are starting to take hold as this all evolves. And then also just end with uh, how investors are um, ingesting and uh, utilizing this information uh, and some of the capital markets innovations uh, that my colleagues in the, our global capital markets division are uh, bringing to market as well. So you could advance the slide. Uh, one more, please. One more. 
So again, the Global Sustainable Finance Group at Morgan Stanley, really think of us as the center of the hub uh, of all things sustainable investing. We don't have clients ourselves. We don't make investments ourselves. It's all about collaborating with our business partners uh, really to bring sustainable investing solutions uh, to our clients. Uh, we also do all of Morgan Stanley's own ESG uh, reporting, disclosure, uh, and stakeholder engagement. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen slides similar to this. Again, we're not gonna get into the science, but uh, in terms of the various pathways that are needed to uh, limit uh, any warming above an additional 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, there's uh, a whole different set of scenarios uh, that have been put forth. Um, and it's become clear uh, that the global capital markets play a integral role in uh, financing the transition to a low, less carbon intensive economy. The numbers on the right hand side of the page here in Italy are probably already stale. Uh, this is a space that I'm sure many have seen is moving incredibly quickly in terms of the amount of commitments, uh, both by corporations and by governments uh, and other stakeholders and investors as well. Uh, to align uh, with, with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and certainly it's gonna pick up even more steam heading into COP26 in Glasgow in, in November. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, just uh, zooming in a little bit on our own climate strategy. Um, there's lots of different components of this, uh, not only in terms of how we're serving our clients uh, across industries, um, not only how we're thinking about it from our own uh, internal risk uh, controls um, uh, and implementation, our own footprint as a global financial services firm, uh, and, finally, and finally how we report and disclose uh, our progress along the way. Um, we were the first U.S. bank to commit to net zero finance emissions by 2050 uh, for our, our own uh, uh, scope three or on balance sheet uh, emissions. Uh, we've also committed to $750 billion of low carbon uh, solutions by 2030. Um, if you go to the next slide, again, this is probably uh, a little bit too detailed and a little too microscopic to see in detail. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this notion of scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Uh, obviously for every industry, uh, different things qualify across different scopes. Uh, and so for a global financial services company, our scope one emissions are, are relatively low, right? That's our, our global real estate footprint. Uh, our scope two emissions uh, are things like business travel. Uh, scope three emissions are many magnitude uh, degrees uh, more uh, uh, quantum higher, right? So that is about our, our what's called financed emissions. Banks are under uh, pressure from numerous stakeholders uh, to better quantify and disclose their scope three emissions. Uh, and there is enormous amount of work, which we'll get into here, here shortly, to build the uh, metrics, the process, the infrastructure to do that uh, at a credible uh, and scalable way across a complex organization um, such as ourselves. Um, but I do think, again, uh, investors are also keen into this notion of scope one, scope three, scope two, scope three um, as well. So I think it's a useful framing. Uh, and if you all are also uh, grappling with this as well, uh, internally, you can also think about ways to map um, your own scope one, scope two, and three, and ultimately report and disclose it, which again, I'll get into why that's important. Next slide, please. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's a host of different acronyms. Uh, uh, that are emerging in this. I'm sure some are very familiar with. Um, I think one uh, I'll introduce here shortly is the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials. Uh, this is a global group of banks that have come together to build the methodology necessary uh, to quantify our scope three emissions. So PCAF is thinking about measuring. Um, last week, many might have seen a UN um, uh, convened announcement around the Net Zero Banking Alliance, along with Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Citigroup, uh, and other leading global banks. Um, really, this is going to be very much focused on how banks can come up with targets uh, around uh, their financed emissions uh, in a commonly agreed upon way. And then finally, uh, TCFD, which has been around now for a few years, um, which is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Uh, which is about the methodology to ultimately report and disclose uh, and track progress uh, on uh, a financial institution or other company's 
um, various uh, climate uh, related risks and opportunities. So uh, all the pieces now have kind of come together. And again, this is a relatively recent development, uh, but I think this is a helpful framing to understand uh, how, that, how the puzzle pieces fit together. Next slide, please. So um, I spent a little time double clicking on PCAF here. And again, I'm not, it's a, gonna be a bit of a one-on-one -on -one level and we can certainly follow up with other materials, but if you go to the next slide, PCAF again is all about measuring financed emissions. It's a bank-led initiative. Uh, Morgan Stanley is on the on the steering committee of PCAF. Citigroup and Bank of America are also involved with PCAF. Uh, and really, this is uh, the banking industry coming together to figure out what are the best practices and what are ultimately the carbon accounting uh, methodology. If you go to the next slide, you can see some of the uh, institutions that are also involved with PCAF. It really started with some of the Dutch banks. It's extrapolated to other European banks and U.S. Um, now on banks on board as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so really the, the, the question at hand here is how do you build a, a carbon accounting uh, framework, right? I mean, the, uh, the metrics um, and the calculations for this are still relatively new um, and uh, doing it in a way that, um, uh, you know, the banks can uh, agree upon and ultimately uh, set a methodology that others can follow and ultimately, um, you know, be adopted by regulators who are also keenly uh, interested in, in banks' activities on these fronts. So there's six different uh, asset classes to start, listed equity and bonds, loans, commercial real estate, mortgages, uh, motor vehicle loans, project finance, and they all have uh, nuance to their calculations. The next slide, please. Uh, this slide is one of, you know, the key uh, conceptual equation here. Again, uh, we'll do it at a very high level, but um, the equation is trying to solve for what are a portfolio's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the calculation is based on uh, understanding uh, the amount of money that a bank might lend. Um, in, in this uh, scenario, again, this is focused on the bank's on balance sheet activities, uh, and then uh, adding what is known as the attribution factor, um, which can be, you know, either a uh, bank or investor or borrower or investee, uh, and then adding a multiplier effect of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, each asset class is going to have slightly different nuance uh, to how this uh, comes together. Um, but just by way of example on this page, right, if you took kind of a ABC bank, they lend a million, $100 million uh, to XYZ publicly traded company that has a billion dollars in total equity and debt. Uh, that company uh, discloses that they emit a million tons of CO2 a year, uh, and then you can ultimately calculate that the bank's portion or attributable uh, financed emissions in that scenario would be 10% uh, of the company's total emissions or 100,000 tons of CO2. And you can get to, again, rolling that up to the portfolio level uh, across a bank's um, balance sheet. So uh, again, this is still under construction. There's uh, public comment periods. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, again, one of the first kind of accounting uh, calculations uh, being put forth in the market. Go to the next slide, please. Again, there are specific accounting rules for uh, different uh, asset classes uh, that are coming together uh, that I mentioned before, uh, where there'll be um, nuanced uh, uh, accounting rules based on the asset class um, that we can dive into. Um, uh, uh, that's all on their public website, uh, if of interest, uh, as well. Next slide. Uh, I think it's important just to kind of figure out how this kind of fits in the chain again, right? So PCAF is coming up with this methodology, the calculations, uh, calculating ultimately the emission intensity. Uh, this can then be uh, aligned with what some might be familiar with uh, SPIs or uh, science-based targets. Uh, which would again would or SPTs, which SPTIs, which would then be able to set uh, uh, a clear pathway uh, where banks and kind of the banking system could come together to understand what is necessary uh, in terms of reducing emissions to reach uh, or not go over the one and a half degree uh, scenario um, that I mentioned earlier. If you go next slide, please. And then again, finally, this fits and is aligned with the TCFD um, recommendations, which have now uh, been firmly you know, put in place by Mark Carney, uh, Michael Bloomberg, and other uh, supporters. Uh, Morgan Stanley has released our own TCFD report. Other banks certainly have as well. 
Um, and this ultimately PCAF development will be an input into the TCFD reporting, um, as I mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, so again, I know a lot of information uh, relatively quickly. Um, I think just pivoting slightly to understand how this is um, uh, percolating in the investor community, if you go to the next slide. ESG investing is growing quickly. I think many have seen the dynamics around this. Um, you know, asset owners are encouraging their asset managers to take a much more intentional approach around integrating ESG into the investment decision process. Uh, we'll, we'll go, we don't have to go into all the slides on here. If you go to the next page, please. Um, again, there's kind of uh, a bifurcated approach here where you're seeing big global asset managers uh, put uh, policies in place around being responsible stewards of capital, um, around uh, you know, being uh, rather they're signatories of the uh, principles for responsible investing, um, and they're adding uh, an ESG integration element into their process uh, at, a, at a house level, at a, at a firm level, right? And then you also have ESG funds uh, that are coming to market and gaining assets, assets quickly. Uh, Europe has just put in place an entire uh, uh, disclosure framework around sustainability funds to limit greenwashing and ensure that ESG funds are actually doing uh, what they say they're doing. Um, but these funds have different approaches. ESG is not just one thing. Some are taking a best in class approach. Some are looking for ESG momentum stories of companies that are at the beginning of their ESG journey uh, and will unlock, unlock capital as they uh, transition. Um, and then some on the passive side are more, that's where the ESG scores come into element and come into uh, uh, factor when you're building ESG indices, uh, the passive indexes, the passive products uh, might follow. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. This is another key slide because it drills into some of how these climate related information, climate analytics are being used by investors. As I mentioned, there's a spectrum of different approaches investors are taking, restriction screening, simply avoiding uh, objectionable companies or sectors. Uh, so you might be basing that information on a company's um, carbon emissions, either disclosed or um, uh, uh, estimated uh, carbon intensity, uh, ESG integration. You can start to look at things like carbon emission earnings at risk uh, or earnings uh, emissions reductions targets. Uh, you can start to look at specific uh, revenue thresholds if you're taking a thematic approach, right? What uh, uh, percentage of a company's revenues is actually coming from clean and uh, uh, emission reducing technologies. Uh, and then finally, this idea of company engagement, where as an active uh, owner of a company's uh, equity, uh, you can um, really signal how important is a company to uh, transition um, and, and lower carbon emissions um, as well. So you can think about, again, decarbonizing at the portfolio level from an investor or decarbonizing the real economy as an active participant in the markets. Next slide, please. And finally, again, as Jeffrey said, the 360 degree view, if you look at, if you go to the next slide, um, uh, the capital markets are playing a key role here, right? You, many are, I'm sure, familiar with the notion of green bonds. Uh, green bonds are gaining traction. They're still a very small um, subset of the overall uh, fixed income market. Um, but in that there's enormous amount of demand and still relatively little supply. And so um, uh, there are different types of green bonds. You kind of have the traditional green bonds, uh, very focused on environmental um, and uh, climate solutions. You have sustainability link bonds where a company can link uh, to a certain uh, KPI. And if they don't hit that KPI around emissions reduction, there'll be a step up in the um, uh, the coupon of the bond. And so uh, investors uh, it really links the company's sustainability strategy with their financing strategy. Uh, and then you have sustainability bonds writ large, which can include a social element and an environmental element, and all have grown quickly. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll notice that the supply dynamic, de demand dynamics are impacting pricing. So you're starting to see a very slight greenium uh, because there's so much demand for these products that uh, issuers are able to save uh, a few basis points uh, over time uh, when they bring these um, uh, issues to market. And we're starting to see that uh, across multiple issuers uh, uh, as well. If you go to the next slide, 
um, just to bring it home a little bit on the transportation side and my colleagues on the global capital markets, Dana Barta and others, some of you uh, may have discussed this, but uh, we're starting to see early stages of how this is evolving into aviation, the transportation sector. Here are just a few examples um, to put some, uh, make it kind of tangible uh, and how it's uh, helping um, aviation uh, intersection with green finance as well. Uh, we expect more to come. Uh, it's not only these types of deals, um, whether they're sustainability linked uh, or green loans, uh, we're also seeing a lot around sustainable aviation fuels um, and even on the more real asset side, how, you know, project finance uh, type transactions to construct the kind of sustainably focused infrastructure it's needed uh, to really uh, uh, mobilize the transition to a less carbon econ intensive economy in the, in the transportation sector. So uh, I think again, early innings on how this is playing out, um, a lot uh, at play, a lot of different dynamics. It's as you uh, may imagine, uh, a challenge to uh, uh, you know, communicate it all efficiently. And I'm sorry if it's a little bit long winded, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little sense on how it's playing out in an organization like Morgan Stanley and some of our peer banks uh, and having a resource for this group uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, uh, we, while we, we're not planning to s distribute the, the PowerPoints, this is being recorded and can be looked at in that context, probably could have spent two hours on that presentation, but it really does give the sweeping overview that we, that we need. Um, uh, we turn now to, uh, to Professor Caroline um, Bradley, who is uh, a professor of law and the associate dean for international and graduate programs at the University of Miami School of Law. Um, Caroline uh, started her career as a lecturer in law at the London School of Economics um, after taking her LLM um, from Jesus College, Cambridge in 1984. She was a solicitor before uh, entering academia. She's an expert, uh, world-renowned expert in, uh, in um, securities regulations and international finance and business. Uh, British, European, and the US. Um, as she speaks, she is teaching a course on climate finance to some fortunate students at the University of Miami. The floor is yours, Caroline. Thank you very much. Uh, so the University of Miami is very happy to be involved in this green financing series. We're a school which has a significant commitment to studying international law, including issues of transnational law and policy. We have a growing emphasis on ESG issues and we have a vibrant environmental law program. And as Jeffrey mentioned this semester, I have been teaching a class on climate finance. So if I could have the next slide, please. My interest in climate finance comes about because I have for many years taught a class in international finance and my research relates to international financial activity and its regulation. And this slide referring to the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures shows that the task force was focused on climate related risks affecting most economic sectors and industries. A large part of the concern comes about because of concerns about financial stability because of physical risks relating to climate change weather related risks such as wildfires and in Florida obviously hurricanes and transition risks coming about because of changes in regulation that uh, we imagine may affect uh, economic and financial activity. The next slide please. So um, I want to first uh, then move on to this executive order with the change of administration in the US in January, it became clear that there is a new approach to climate change at the federal level in the US. And this executive order in January reflects this, emphasizing that federal agencies need to capture the costs of greenhouse gas emissions. There's now an interagency working group on the social costs of greenhouse gases and many other moves to address climate change, but as yet we haven't seen any move to introduce, for example, a carbon price for the US, which is something that many market participants would like to see. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, I identify some of the range of international developments. And I think, you know, the story that I want to tell is one in which the US is coming on board as a regulatory matter with movements that really began elsewhere that the US was in, involved with in, at, in earlier stages, but then moved away from for a period of time. 
And so uh, this reflects the large number of different moves at the international level. We've heard about some of them already. Uh, ensuring that the financial system takes account of the cost of greenhouse gases, in particular carbon dioxide, from the Financial Stability Board and the networks of financial regulators, such as the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, the network for greening the financial system involving central banks and supervisors, to the IMF, the World Bank, and a number of UN-based collaborative pro projects with uh, the private sector, including, we've already heard about the principles for responsible investment, but also principles for responsible banking and for sustainable insurance. And now the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which is, uh, has been, is being rolled out in the lead up to COP26 in November. The next slide, please. So the articulated aims of this alliance are about accelerating the alignment of investment and lending with net zero through technical collaboration involving an increasing number of financial institutions with credible and transparent commitments to financing the transition. In addition, there's a focus on analytical tools and market infrastructure, including credit rating agencies, auditors and stock exchanges. And these UN-based initiatives reflect a recognition that a public-private collaboration is essential to the Net Zero project. And this is something that we heard in the first presentation, but I think it's also very clear that different actors have some quite different views as to how this should all work out. So the next slide, please. We've already heard that the EU is making moves in this direction. And the EU so far, I think, is really ahead of the curve in introducing legally binding measures to include addressing climate change, both in corporate reporting and also in not just the aspirations, but the obligations of financial firms. And in particular, in introducing this EU taxonomy to identify sustainable economic activity. And the taxonomy is geared towards eliminating greenwashing. So we see here that uh, the taxonomy is about a common language for businesses and investors. Activity that is aligned with the taxonomy is considered sustainable, and you have to be aligned with the taxonomy to be considered sustainable. It's a complicated and incremental process, as is the case with much EU lawmaking, and it relies on the work of a te technical expert group. The language here from the EU Commission's communication from last week refers to a robust science-based transparency tool for companies and investors with clear performance criteria. But as we can see from news reports, there are some, uh, there's some debate as to whether what the EU is putting into place really meets up with the scientific assessments. And I think that this is uh, going forward going to be something that uh, we're going to see more of. On the next slide, I give you a little bit more information about the EU Taxonomy Climate Delegated Act. So first of all, there's an EU taxonomy regulation. And last week, the EU rolled out the Taxonomy Climate Delegated Act. The document was published along with annexes of about 500 pages of technical details. Um, if this is an area you work in, you're already familiar with the amazing complexity of the technical details, uh, but it's somewhat surprising or stunning to see uh, 500 pages worth in uh, attached to a, a, a delegated act like this. Activities get to qualify as environmentally sustainable if they meet or contribute to one of six objectives, climate change mitigation or ad adaptation, protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and protection of healthy ecosystems. I should mention that the EU's taxonomy is aimed eventually to deal with e, e S and G measures, but the focus at the moment is on sustainability. So that's another indicator of how this is an incremental process. There are detailed performance thresholds in the Delegated Act, for example, specifying limits on greenhouse gas emissions for activity in order for it to be considered as sustainable. The limits vary with respect to the activity, and in some case, for example, transport, some of the limits that are specified will become more demanding over time. So another example of an evolving picture rather than a picture that is at all static. On the next slide, I identify some of the critiques that have been made of the EU taxonomy. Essentially, these are that it is binary, that it is incomplete, 
and that it is political rather than purely based on the science. So the proponents of the taxonomy will say that it's not just binary, it involves a distinction between low impact, low carbon activities, enabling activities and transition activities rather than strictly binary. And the commission also says that just because activities are not taxonomy aligned does not mean that they cannot be financed. But whether or not that, that is the case depends on financial market pa participants and how they use the ta taxonomy. And it may be that if we're thinking about institutions like Morgan Stanley, the taxonomy will be relevant, but we know that there are a lot of hedge funds that take positions that are not perhaps uh, focused on uh, sustainability as a prior commitment. We know in other areas that financial firms engage in broad de-risking when faced with complex rules. And so one of the things to watch for may be some of this de-risking activity with respect to sustainability. So we're likely to see evolution of behavior in two different directions, I think. With respect to incompleteness, uh, we know that there is a failure in the delegated measure to address gas and nuclear power. This has received some press uh, reportage. It's not the first time we've seen this sort of development in EU law, the idea that um, sometimes issues get too difficult to agree on and we push them off to later. It won't be the last context in which we see this, but it is something that makes it harder for businesses to plan. With respect to the political uh, aspect, the political critique of the taxonomy, the inclusion of biofuels has been criticized by many. Biofuels are included because they're important to the economies of some EU member states. Again, this is a general feature of the legislative process. It's by no means unique to the EU. Uh, it's something that we can imagine operating in the US as well, or we don't even necessarily have to imagine it. But it is something that is that bothers the NGOs that focus on environmental sustainability and is something that we're going to need to watch for. On the final slide, I would like to bring us back to the US. Uh, obviously, in our interconnected world, many businesses are affected by EU rules and are having to worry about the EU taxonomy. And also, I think businesses sometimes will pay attention to what's happening in the EU as a signal of what may happen elsewhere. We're also seeing increasing attention focused on climate change by regulators in the US, and I give some examples on this slide. It's clear that there has been an interest in these issues even before the presidential transition in January. For example, the CFTC Market Risk Advisory Committee's Market Risk Subcommittee, which published a report in September last year. This year, the SEC has focused on ESG claims by managed funds, which is, it has identified as an enforcement priority. And I already noticed that uh, an ESG fund that I uh, myself invested in relatively recently has uh, pulled back from the ESG claims that it was making. The SEC has also asked for input on climate disclosure. The questions the SEC is asking about relate di directly to the discussions that we're having here today. But as in other areas, the approach the US takes may differ in the details from that in the EU. It's one thing to have cooperation at the international level in the G20 or in the United Nations, IMF, World Bank, but that tends to be short on detail. And for corporates and financial firms and for compliance, the details matter. I very much look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations in this webinar. And thank you for involving me. Thank you very much, Caroline. And through you to the University of Miami generally, it's Nice to hear that um, despite the 500 pages, there's still a concern about incompleteness. So I guess you need a thousand pages to avoid the incompleteness. Um, that's a perfect segue to our next uh, speaker, Beth Viola. Um, Beth is a senior policy advisor in Holland and Knights, uh, Washington, DC office, and will be really focusing on, on US, emerging US government policy, already mentioned by I think every, every speaker, understandably. Beth's uh, uh, role and, and expertise goes back uh, uh, over 15 years. She was involved in work developing, understanding, communicating um, a, a range of acts, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, the en Energy Independence and Security Act, Energy Policy Act, Clean Power Plan, Implementation, Renewable Fuel Standard, um, and, and, and many others. Uh, Beth um, has been involved um, at the executive and the legislative level. level. She was um, a senior uh, policy advisor uh, to the White House, 
um, on environmental quality, served as its principal liaison with um, officials and industry um, actors, as well as the media. Uh, she was one of Vice President Gore's chief environmental advisors uh, in the White House as well. Prior to that, she worked on Capitol Hill. Um, most recently, and again, a point that was just mentioned, uh, she's published on reclaiming a federal lead on social cost of carbon. Beth took her undergraduate degree from Providence College and has spent time at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Beth? Great. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit today about what's happening at the federal government at the federal level uh, and especially with the new administration. So next slide. Uh, I want to start with the fact that uh, President candidate Biden, when he was running uh, for president last year, uh, spent a tremendous amount of time talking about the climate crisis and made climate change one of his core components of his efforts. Um, since talking the talk during the campaign, he is now walking the walk and has established the first uh, national climate task force. Um, really taking a comprehensive whole of government approach as it, retain, it pertains to addressing climate change. Um, one of the first things he did as president was to sign an executive order on January 27th, um, creating the National Climate Task Force, which includes all of the agencies that you see listed here. Uh, they've subsequently added the uh, NOAA. Um, but this, uh, you, I love this, um, a tweet from Gina McCarthy, who is the uh, chair of the National Climate Task Force, and as most of you probably know, the uh, climate domestic advisor uh, to the president. Um, and here you can see all of the different cabinet secretaries on Zoom, including the president and the vice president, uh, kicking off the very first meeting that they had on February 11th. Um, and, uh, and since then, they have subsequently had three meetings on the climate task force. Um, so I think it's important um, to note that this is very much a comprehensive effort led out of the White House. I want to talk a little bit about the financial institute in agencies today and the role they're playing. But I want to, I also did note on here that the Department of State and the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is not included in this national climate task force. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as it's part of the uh, international component. Um, led by Secretary John Kerry. Next slide. So I want to be mindful of time here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look at my notes a little bit here as we go along. But I I want to say there are really four key agencies as that are listed here, and I want to walk through a little bit about all of the things that they are doing. Um, many of them have developed working groups, studies. Um, and we'll be implementing various policies that will help guide the financial sector um, as, they as this administration works to combat climate change. So I want to turn to the next slide and kind of break this down by agency. So the Department of Treasury, um, you know, the Department of Treasury is utilizing its ability to regulate domestic and international finance policy um, to address uh, and combat climate change. Uh, Secretary Yellen, since taking the helm at the Department of Treasury, has been incredibly vocal um, and has given a number of speeches uh, since taking over, um, talking about the important focus of climate change on financial markets. Um, there are four things that have been highlighted uh, as a way to kind of address uh, reducing emissions and using the climate and uh, using the financial sector. One is um, exercising US leadership on the Financial Stability Oversight Council. The second is collaboration with the White House and Congress, making sure that all of the policies are coordinated. Uh, Increasing the scale of involvement in international climate finance. You saw some of the announcements that came out of the White House last week uh, as part of the climate week that the president held um, and climate summit. And then increasing the scale of involvement um, in international climate finance, i.e. through Paris. Um, and then lastly, reestablishing the G20 Sustainable Finance Group 
uh, as a method to tackle climate change and uh, promote finance that supports international climate and other sustainability goals. One thing I wanna mention here too, is that last week, uh, right before the climate summit, um, Secretary uh, Yellen did announce the establishment of a climate hub within the Department of Treasury. Um, and the purpose will be to leverage climate related programs by connecting tools, capabilities, and expertise across the entire department. So looking at everything from the domestic finance, economic policy, international affairs, and tax policy departments within Treasury. Um, the person who was nominated to do that, his name is John, is Tom, John Morton. I have a friend, Tom Morton, John Morton. And um, he has a uh, history of working. He came out of the Obama administration. He's been working uh, at an investment firm since he left the uh, Obama White House. Um, and I think he has a good history as being the chief operating officer of uh, what was OPEC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, I will say he has been a little bit controversial. Uh, the green community, the NGOs have said that he doesn't have enough green experience uh, and others have said he doesn't have enough finance experience to be in that role. So I suspect that probably somewhere in the middle there, it's about he's about the right person. Um, next slide. So, uh, the second agency that's important, obviously, as this conversation is continuing, is the Federal Reserve System, uh, which, as you know, effectively monitors uh, the entire U.S. financial system and is seeking to mitigate any uh, negative impacts on the economy through financial markets, both uh, domestically and overseas. Um, so two big things here, I think. One is the Supervision Climate Committee, the S. CC, these I'm always falling over my words uh, talking about all of these different acronyms here. Um, you know, the SCC will take on a micro prudential focus, meaning they're going to analyze risk to individual institutions, operations, and structures, um, really looking at systemic risk. Um, the recommendations from the SCC will strengthen strengthen the government's capacity to identify and assess financial risk from climate and develop um, appropriate programs to ensure the resilience of supervised firms to those risks. The Financial Stability Climate Committee, the FSCC, um, will mitigate climate risk through macro uh, perspective, which is considers the potential for complex interactions across the financial system. So um, they will be looking at this more broadly. The FSCC's uh, goal is to promote resilience uh, of the financial system uh, to climate system, climate related financial risks to ensure coordination with the Financial Stability Oversight Board, Oversight Council, which has already been talked about a little, and its member agencies. Um, and, the, and lastly, to increase the Federal Reserve's international engagement and influence on this issue. Um, the FSCC and the SCC, we anticipate, are going to work closely to coordinate uh, an integrated climate-related risk portfolio um, and that may affect uh, responsibilities for companies uh, and markets. Um, next slide. So we've already talked a little bit um, about the SEC, but the Securities Exchange Commission has had a focus on climate since 2010. Um, the guidance issued in 2010 was provided to public companies regarding existing disclosure requirements as they apply to climate change matters. And the commission has recently asserted the need to update these requirements. So in May 2020, the SEC Investor Advisory Committee approved recommendations uh, urging the commission to begin an effort to update those reporting requirements um, and to include material, decision useful, environmental, social, and governance factors. So really taking into account ESG. Um, and then in December of last year, uh, the 
ESG subcommittee of the SEC Asset Management Advisory Committee uh, issued a preliminary recommendation that the commission require the adoption of standards by which uh, corporate issuers disclose material ESG risks. Um, and then last month, the SEC began accepting public comments, which has also been referenced on current SEC disclosure rules and what aspects should be considered as we move forward to ensure the disclosure of consistent, comparable, and reliable information on climate change. And then, of course, the uh, Climate and ESG Enforcement Task Force um, was designed to develop initiatives to proactively identify ESG-related misconduct um, uh, including through the use of sophisticated data analysis to mine and assess information across registrants to identify potential violations. So I think we're going to see a lot more out of um, that task force going forward. Next slide. Uh, the CFTC. Um, so they seek to support uh, market integrity and transparency. Uh, as everyone knows, um, looking at some of the things that they've done and said recently, I think first is the climate market risk, uh, climate, climate related market risk subcommittee of the market risk advisory committee, um, which was developed in 2020 of September and provided 53 recommendations um, to manage climate risk on the US financial system. And some of the key takeaways to that, to those, to that report include uh, an acknowledgement that there are that existing statutes, statutes already provide US financial regulators with a wide ranging and flexible authority um, that can be used to start addressing climate, financial climate related risk now. So already feeling like they have the authority to do what they need to. Um, the regulators can promote, uh, can help promote the role of financial markets as providers to solutions on climate related risks. So they see themselves uh, also as not only having the authority, but having um, the ability to provide some solutions. Um, and that financial in innovation is required to not only efficiently manage climate risk, but also to facilitate the flow of capital to help accelerate the net zero transition and to increase uh, economic opportunity. Um, also at CFTC, looking at the climate risk unit, um, the CRU uh, was in, designed and intended to accelerate early CFTC engagement in support of industry-led and market-driven processes in, as it relates to climate change. Um, this uh, unit is critical to ensuring um, that new products and markets fairly facilitate hedging, price discovery, market transparency, and capital allocation. And the CRU will um, support increased participation in both domestic and international forums aimed at trying to build consensus for consistent standards disclosures and practices across derivative products um, and markets, uh, as well as ensure there is clarity uh, on regulatory capital and accounting standards. So CFTC is one of the four major agencies that's gonna have an important role here. Um, and the next slide, um, uh, well, sorry, I guess that was the fourth already. Um, so, that's what the federal agencies are doing. Obviously, they are all working collaboratively with the administration, but we also have Congress. And what is Congress thinking about doing here? Um, as many of you know, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has introduced before the Climate Risk Disclosure Act. Uh, she recently reintroduced it on April 15th uh, in the Senate, and it was introduced in the House by uh, Representative Sean Kasten from Illinois. Um, this bill directs the SEC to issue rules within two years that requires every public company to disclose various climate-related transactions. Um, and those 
those disclosures include its direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions, the total amount of fossil fuel related assets that it owns or manages, how a company's valuation would be affected if climate change continues at its current pace, current trajectory, or if it's able to, or if we are able to successfully reduce CO2 emissions to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. Um, and it requires companies to address its risk management strategies related to the physical risks and transition risks posed by climate change. It is unclear to me though at this point how much um, momentum there will be on Capitol Hill for that legislation to move forward. And so therefore, I think what will happen is that the federal agencies will just continue on its own trajectory and they feel like they do not need an awful lot of oversight from Capitol Hill. Um, just one last slide, I wanted to just touch upon what's happening, um, you know, on the international side. Obviously, we've seen Secretary Kerry nominated as the international climate czar, so he is working uh, in a parallel fashion to, um, to uh, Gina McCarthy in the White House. Um, Secretary Kerry has been very busy traveling around the world lately and all in a lead up to the summit that happened last week uh, on climate out of the White House. Um, I think, uh, you know, looking at what's happening uh, between the US and the EU, you know, uh, as somebody who's been going to the cops since I went with Al Gore in 1997, I should say, which makes me officially very old, um, that, uh, you know, these, the EU and the US have worked very closely and were very coordinated in their efforts uh, to try to get the Paris Accord done. Uh, Secretary Kerry recently went to um, Europe to uh, meet with the EU leaders um, and trying to reestablish the US leadership uh, with the EU on climate change. Uh, and are trying to figure out how they're gonna work collaboratively to sort of move forward uh, as we look towards Glasgow in November. Um, I think one of the things that's important to mention here is that there is a lot of room for collaboration um, as we go forward, but there are also some opportunity, uh, there are some also some areas of where we can see some potential conflict between the US and the EU, uh, specifically around the idea of the carbon border adjustment tax, uh, which could have serious trade implement, impl implications for the United States. Um, and then also, uh, we may see competition in clean energy and technology markets. But I think overall, the US and the EU, EU are fairly coordinated and would really like to try to put some pressure uh, on China to see if it can't get China to commit to reducing uh, its greenhouse gas emissions uh, more significantly before 2025. So I will stop it there in the interest of time and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, we are at one hour halfway through. We have one more uh, basic presentation from, from me. By agreement among the panelists, I'm going to sharply uh, truncate my presentation since we're running over time um, and happy to talk about this further with others. So if you could project that, please, um, Deborah. Um, my, my talk uh, uh, is to or was to look at fundamental data and methodological issues uh, which have come up and to take a bit of a deep dive. I'm going to not take a deep dive. It's going to be a skim um, based on timing. Next slide. Um, uh, the, again, this was the structure that I introduced earlier on um, about everything that leads up into and produces the uh, the reports and trying to break down what goes into that a bit, bit more next slide. What I'd like to just to do to give an overview, given the limited time, is first of all, talk about two problem sets, and then third, the building blocks uh, and issues associated with that. Um, as we look into this subject, I think, in addition to the 500 pages, we are dealing with a very complex uh, interaction between science, legal, and economic principles. Um, bringing all that together in a, in a sensible way is, is very difficult. Um, 
when I started to really study this, the, the uh, I wrote constellation of, of, of acronyms. There's, there's just, you know, so many different initiatives um, and going in so many different directions. And it's, it's quite difficult to get your mind around that. Even the words that are used, uh, people have been using words, myself included, uh, next um, uh, there, you know, targets. I think we know what a target is, but <clears throat> I mean, people really know the difference between a benchmark, a metrics, a parameter, and a key performance indicator. They have a lot in common. Um, and then the way to get there, alignment, coherence, pathways, compliance. It, reading the materials and really understanding what the rules are um, and what the implications of those terms are, are critical. And then we have these taxonomies, as Caroline said, taxonomies are a lot more than definitions. They carry with them regulatory and financial implications and political ones. Uh, the person, you know, groups that define things often determine them. Um, and so um, struggling through and really getting more analytic about terms, I think that really hasn't happened yet. Next slide. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the objective Beth mentioned, you know, the objective here in reporting and data is to have uh, the consensus objective is to have comparable and consistent uh, information uh, between companies over time and over space, um, especially in a global marketplace. And the question is, what are the what are the you know the impediments to that and the problems associated with that? And I've listed you know several. Problem number one, fundamental problem, despite the you know the the polished slides that we see, is the availability of consensus data. It's a very very complicated area. That is the 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 basis of of everything. And there are two general approaches to work in this area. One is disclosure, indirect consequences by putting information out. And the second is regulatory prescriptive um, regimes. More on that in part two of the, of, of the series. But even more fundamental than that, there are really different vantage points um, uh, uh, in, 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 in action in this place. When people talk about targets and they talk about action, is the reference point climate change mitigation, uh, asset level, uh, emissions or all the federal, all, all the financial regulators, they're often looking at the perspective of financial exposure of the company. The terms used are often transitional risk, meaning uh, risk of uh, to the company of a movement towards a, a, a low carbon economy and, and physical risks associated with their assets and, and their supply chain. Next, next slide. Um, there's the question already alluded to, uh, national versus global standards, especially as international companies need to to work work through. We didn't talk much about carbon offsets. You know, all these races to zero zero net emissions must presuppose a a heavy dose of carbon offsets, and that itself is a very complex subject. It has not been harmonized. Um, far from it. Uh, same with uh, standards on how to calculate removed emissions from uh, from from the area. If that is not challenging enough. Not everything is, quanti is quantified. Beth mentioned um, a number of things which are clearly qualitative, like uh, governance strategy and risk management. How do you quantify and compare, compare those? That said, there are important movements towards uh, improving. Jamie mentioned uh, you know, the work being done by, um, by the um, uh, uh, PCAF, and there are others. The, the, the CDP, another acronym, which is the main vehicle for disclosure, has really aligned up with, uh, with the, 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 uh, the recommendations of the TCDFD and, and has really started to focus on the scope three emissions, which really is the critical issue, as Jamie mentioned. Um, and we see you know, uh, additional work you know, by the OECD and others. So, Progress is starting on trying to bring these things together. You know, next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm going to now just really go through this. I mean, it's much, much too quickly. But the, uh, what, I, what I had planned to do is to go through each of those boxes and discuss elements of those and issues associated, you know, with um, establishing targets, what the underlying data is. Um, but I'd like to jump to the next slide, just to some things that are just a bit more interesting. Um, the, uh, the, the, the metrics and the benchmarks and the model, model me methods and assumptions, these words carry with it you know, so, so much practical input. You'll see that, that if, you, if you get into the materials, there's a fundamental kind of question of, are we talking about absolute emissions or the intensity based upon an industry metrics? And I'm sure we'll hear about that from our industry participants. But even more fundamentally is the question, uh, is when we talk about data, um, are we talking about model data, which is modeled 
ex, from an ex ante perspective or reported data ex post emissions, there are really challenges associated with both, especially in the green financing context where you might not know the use or the actual emissions at the time of, of the financing. On the other hand, you know, um, I mean, model data and going forward, look forward looking information is, is, is really complicated and a lot of, um, of effort is being made. The next couple of slides, I'm not going to go over them, but this is from the TCFD, which goes through all the issues associated, the questions, um, uh, the challenges associated with, with those, those building blocks. Next slide. Um, uh, but at, at, at the heart of, of, of target setting, um, is the established principle of the next slide, please, slide 11, um, of scenario analysis. Uh, that that um, you know, scenario analysis is now is now central to the concept of modeling and, and, and data calculation and, and reporting. Scenario analysis looks at you know analyzing future events uh, by considering alternative outcomes, and in this context, is often driven by potential decarbonization and technological pathways. To reach different different ob objectives, um, you know, Jamie mentioned 1.5 degree that is stopping uh, um, um, an increase of more than 1.5 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial level temperatures. Uh, that is now, you know, the the, the term of art. That wasn't uh, a couple of years ago. It was kind of the, the two degree scenario, but the approach is sectoral and and does and does you know look to what kind, type of data is available from from each uh, each sector. Um, and we'll be getting into that in, in just a moment. Final slide, um, the, uh, the work that Jamie mentioned on attribution, how we translate investment uh, uh, or, or debt to, to uh, uh, calculating emissions is really critical for, the, for our subject matter, the scope three emissions, and there really are the two levels. There's allocations of physical level data to financial instruments, loans and security, uh, investments and also the allocations of, of, of macro carbon emissions to micro economic actors, portfolios, and, and clients. Um, the materiality standard, which really overlays everything, including under U.S. Uh, and, and, and most securities laws, you know, raises questions as to what is and what is not, you know, uh, material. I don't have time to get into you know, the kind of mundane but fundamental points about what kind of due diligence went into. Um, collecting the information and what kind of verification um, uh, has been done, not to mention the question of calculation tools. This is such a complicated area. The tools that are being developed and the sciences really go a long way towards producing the results. And so, um, you know, those are things that that, that go into to uh, you know the makeup of of the data and the, and the calculations. So with that, um, and again, you could. Uh, look at the, the the presentation on the recording. I'm happy to answer and discuss these issues more with you. We now turn to the uh, the industrial sectoral approach, um, uh, and our our uh, our first uh, uh, speaker um, is uh, Daniel De Silva um, uh, of of Boeing. And I, I should uh, I said from the beginning, while well, I'm a partner at at, at Holland and I, I'm on succumbing to the aviation working group. Of which Daniel is the the co-chair. Um, Daniel uh, De Silva is vice president of strategic regulatory policy for Boeing Capital Corporation, and is responsible for arranging, structuring, and providing financing for for Boeing uh, products. As mentioned, Dan Daniel is the co-chair with Airbus, um, colleague of the Aviation Working Group, a group that. Uh, drives the, the the regulation of financing um, for the aviation industry. Dan has really taken a leading role in uh, in helping us um, understand and develop um, all of our environmental work, uh, including as he'll be discussing uh, the carbon calculator, which has recently been produced and released by uh, the Aviation Working Group. Uh, Daniel has worked in all parts of the industry, um, uh, trained as an aeronautical engineer, um, graduated from Brazilian University um, and uh, was uh, uh, born in Paris and brings all those perspectives to bear. Daniel? Thank, thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, uh, Deborah, if you can uh, put the uh, presentation up, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we're gonna go uh, a little bit um, uh, micro here compared to the macro level discussions that we've had. 
and focus on the uh, aviation industry and more specifically in the aviation finance industry and what AWG has done uh, related to that. So if you go to the next chart, please. Um, first of all, why, why is uh, an aviation finance uh, organization that, that works in the regulatory aspects of aviation finance, why are we even involved in it? Well, uh, the, the issue of climate change obviously has been, uh, has permeated into the investor community in aviation. Uh, and you can see here, just this data just only goes up to 2019. Uh, but uh, the trend uh, is, is very clear and it continued through um, even during the pandemic in 2020. We thought the um, pandemic might distract from the interest of investors in uh, the uh, environmental aspect of uh, the aviation world, but it did not. It continued and, and if anything, it actually accelerated. If you go to the next chart, one of the things that um, uh, we looked at was um, the world of aviation was being well covered in terms of aircraft technology and airline emissions as to what to do um, uh, towards a environmental goals, uh, setting environmental goals and, and measuring environmental performance. Um, uh, in the, on the left side of the screen here, what you see is what uh, uh, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, based in Montreal, has done uh, and worked with industry to create uh, recommendations and standards for, for aircraft. And it is a certification basis that should be implemented over the next seven years or so. Uh, that will uh, ensure that any new aircraft uh, being built uh, conforms to a minimum standard of CO2 emissions. And over time, that standard gets tighter and tighter. And for uh, obviously new projects, it, it has to, to um, conform to the highest, uh, uh, highest standards. On the right side of the screen, uh, ICAO also worked with the industry on now the operational side, and that was geared towards airline emissions. It created a carbon offsetting scheme uh, and reduction for the international aviation. It's focused on international flights, not really related to domestic operations, but it was focused on how the aircraft is operated. Now, if you go to the next chart, what are we missing here? Well, you had growing investor concern, but there are no standards for the aircraft finance industry. Those two standards that I just mentioned were um, focused on aircraft technology and therefore on what the manufacturers are doing. And if you're speaking in uh, um, ESG terms uh, for um, a financier, those would be the scope one um, emissions, which is what comes um, upstream from your activities, your, your supplier, the supplier would be here, the aircraft OEMs. And then on the downstream activity or what uh, the ESG world calls scope three emissions, that is what Corsia is measuring or at least part of what Corsia is uh, uh, measuring. Um, and, uh, but there's no ability for the aircraft finance industry to uh, measure its own impact or have any standards or metrics or principles for how what they do and the aircraft they are investing in their financing how that um, affects the uh, carbon footprint of uh, the aviation world so uh, awg got together and i have to uh, make honorable mention here to watson farley williams the law firm that uh, was uh, went really deep with us in the study uh, and the formation of the um, uh, Aviation Working Group ESG Committee, as well as Clifford Chance. And we work together amongst the AWG members, which includes the aircraft and engine OEMs, uh, lessors and financiers um, uh, of, of aircraft and engines and really discussed what should we do, what uh, actions should we take, should we create principles, should we worry about 
ETS tracking in the um, uh, European uh, environment? Uh, um, do we need new metrics uh, or do we use industry metrics? Uh, all those um, acronyms that we all saw and heard in the first uh, part of the session. What we decided to do was to invest in creating a very simple tool, a tool that was geared towards what the um, uh, constituents of AWG really wanted to measure, which is not trying to mimic real world, real world use of the aircraft because they really can't control how the aircraft is used or configured by an airline. Um, but to look at carbon emissions of a portfolio on an annual basis based on a set of standards and assumptions that would then be repeatable and comparable year over year. So when we talk about data integrity and data usage, the difficulty here that we kept running into is if, the if, if we were to try to mimic real world and the, ch and the usage of that aircraft changes over time, is the financier responsible for it or do they have any control over that or not? And then and the conclusion we reached was, was no, they have no control. So if you wanna measure a portfolio progress over time, is my portfolio getting less uh, or emitting less carbon emissions over time, you really have to kind of adopt the standard and stick with it. It's like having the automotive industry equivalent to the miles per gallon or the liters per kilometer um, that uh, that is uh, measured out there. It's basically you're comparing standard to standard. If you go to the next chart, so the calculator, as I said, is very simple. Um, it is, uh, it, it gives the um, user the ability to select an airplane model, input annual cycles and flight hours, which leasing companies usually know from reports they get from their customers. Uh, and in case of financiers that are a step away from uh, the actual user of the aircraft, the OEMs offer a standardized annual cycles and hours that represent the average utilization of, of those aircraft models uh, in the industry. And then the calculator um, uses OEM data that was provided to AWG for uh, the calculator. And it uses that to calculate CO2 per annum. And it can also show it by flight hours or per trip. If we go to the next chart, I just want to show you a little bit of pictorial of a couple of uh, charts that uh, uh, illustrate what the calculator looks like. Um, you can create and name portfolios and uh, uh, track them over time or uh, create a 2020 portfolio, 2021 portfolio and compare them uh, or create portfolios that are, you know, wide body and single aisle aircraft and compare those and uh, uh, separate them by type and do whatever it is. There's a lot of flexibility uh, in, in the tool that, that you as the user can, uh, can send. And then you save that. Those um, uh, portfolios are saved by entity. So if you have an account with the AWG Carbon Calculator uh, for your entity, it'll be saved as an entity portfolio. Uh, and then if you go to the next chart, it just has different views. It stores the portfolios and endeavor go to the next one. Uh, and then you can have reports and comparisons uh, in various different formats, uh, graphical and tabular formats that you can use to, uh, uh, to compare. Um, and then if you go to the next chart, um, you can see here other um, uh, portfolio comparison um, uh, examples. And then finally, uh, if you go to the next chart, what we set out to develop, as I said, was uh, uh, something that was very specific for aircraft financiers, investors, and lessors. There was no attempt here to mimic real world carbon emissions. There are other tools out there that if you really want to go down to the minute detail of how an airline operates uh, an aircraft and, and measure that uh, set of emissions, you can do it. Um, or, you know, airlines will do their own reports, but this is about the, the financiers. Um, the, the way we established the, uh, well, obviously there was a cost for AWG to develop this tool and to maintain it over time. 
it'll be available at no cost to AWG members. And there's a free trial period that goes to May 15th. And then after that, it has a, a, a price associated with it. And then obviously we keep looking at increased functionality and enhancements. We already talked about refining our assumptions to ensure that there's a clear comparability between aircraft OEMs and that we keep uh, also adding new aircraft models over time. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and then uh, uh, we can maybe address some other things in, in Q&A. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Dan. And digging into those details and creating the calculator of cost brought all these issues out it, uh, clearly. On to shipping. Um, we have um, Michael Parker and Joby Tenev speaking now on shipping. Um, couldn't possibly have a better, a better pair. Um, Michael um, uh, joined Citibank in 1977. He has uh, recently been appointed the chairman of Citi's global shipping logistics and offshore um, business. Um, uh, Michael has been a, a leader in this space for uh, quite a while. Um, he has chaired uh, various uh, uh, London um, uh, uh, based committees on intercargo. He was an expert um, uh, uh, in working with the, the DT Department of Transport um, uh, on its uh, marine strategy. Um, but probably most interesting for our purposes, um, he was the chairman of the steering committee on the Poseidon Principles launched in New York in June um, 2019 um, and is the first chairman of the Poseidon Principles Association um, dealing with uh, industry approaches to, uh, to uh, emissions in the shipping context. Uh, Jovi is a partner in the New York office of Holland and Knight. Jovi represents financial institutions, investment banks, in a range of, of, of transactions. Um, he um, has been involved in, uh, on energy and regulatory and comparative law um, in cross-border aircraft, vessel, alternative fin uh, financing for, uh, for years. Um, most recently, he was involved in a groundbreaking transaction on the uh, international uh, seaway transaction, which was the, uh, the first sustainab sustainability-linked um, uh, pricing-linked transaction of a uh, New York Stock Exchange a listed ship owner uh, consistent with the decarbonization trajectory of the uh, Poseidon principles. So the floor is over to you, Michael and Jovi. Thank you, Jeffrey. First slide, please, Deborah. Thank you. Um, now, I could have put City, we could have put the Poseidon principles, but we've put a blue sky maritime coalition as the opening page of this, um, and Jovi will touch on that uh, at the end of our first section. And the reason this is relevant, uh, and go to the next slide please Deborah, is that what was very interesting here from Jamie and Caroline was the sort of mainly US but also global context um, for this. Um, and I decided to, just in one week to select a whole series of headlines that really touch on really on ESG, but particularly on the environmental issues, and, and particularly in the light of the pre, these were all pre the Biden summit, in fact, but in terms of the, the, the emphasis as we move towards Glasgow, which I think will be a very fundamental meeting for, for lots of industries, including shipping. But the one thing that distinguishes shipping is shipping has a real global regulator in the form of the International Maritime Organization. And that, um, that body was charged along with ICOA in Kyoto in 97 where Beth was with the shipping and aviation industries coming back to the climate change conference in order to discuss their proposals on decarbonization and it took until 2018 for the IMO to do that with its ambition to cut global emissions by 50% by 2050. Next slide please. So those, those macro headlines you know, consistent, if you like, with the detail that Jamie and Caroline went through. But if we look at what we've done in shipping, and I will come um, in a moment to the Poseidon principles and give you my three minute version that normally takes 30 minutes. But shipping has been focused on this issue within the industry, certainly for seven or eight years. Decarbonization since the 97 Kyoto challenge has been something that people have talked about. And so, we've been coming at this from, from some distance. Um, and what we've created in the last couple of years of the Poseidon principles 
the Sea Cargo Charter, which is the major commodity companies and energy companies, essentially using the same methodology, but on a voyage as opposed to annual basis. Uh, the insurance sector is working on their equivalent of the Poseidon principles. And this all heads with the IMO in parallel, of course, towards getting shipping high on the agenda in Glasgow. I think what was very helpful was, was um, John Kerry telling the IMO to move to a zero target by 2050 as opposed to this 50% cut. But clearly what goes on in the IMO, which affects international shipping, uh, it doesn't necessarily affect what goes on in the US given the Jones Act and cabotage. So that's an area which Jovi will touch on at the end. But as we've looked at all these things and, and others have talked about, you know, the taxonomy, the data, all those sort of things, things like the um, Net Zero Banking Alliance and things Jamie talked about, I, I think are going to be very helpful in helping all of us define what that is. And we hope that the US and others will, will come to agree with the EU, or at least together with the EU and, of course, China, work out a taxonomy that is, is global. We know we need a carbon price. Um, whether that gets agreed in Glasgow is highly unlikely, but the, the data around emissions, I think, is going to be a driver for every industry, not just shipping and aviation, but every hard to abate industry in particular. Um, and that data is what we've used uh, in the Poseidon principles, as I will explain. But just before I do that, I think, as we've seen, uh, I've seen certainly my aviation colleagues in City deal with you know, a crisis that no one has seen in their industry in their lifetimes. So shipping actually, other than the cruise sector and, and the drilling sector, actually has come through COVID very well. Um, now, what COVID did and what the ever given blocking the Suez Canal did was remind people about the importance of supply chains and the role of shipping in that supply chain. And I think the, the, the argument that will go to Glasgow is very much about the importance of decarbonization, decarbonizing shipping, but in the context of the global supply chain and the responsibility, as I put there at the bottom, of consumers ultimately paying. Ship owners have been so used to being told they have to pay for something that they sort of are standing there waiting to be hit with yet another charge. That's not going to happen this time because the data on emissions is not going to be the emissions just from the ship, it's going to be the emissions that the cargo on the ship creates and where the responsibility for that lies. So next slide, please. So with the Poseidon principles, um, we took advantage of the April 18 uh, IMO ambition, um, uh, where they also introduced what's called the DCS, the data collection system, which required for the first time every ship owner to report the emissions on each vessel to uh, their flag state, but via what we call a recognized organization, which in shipping is classification society like DNV, Lloyd's Register and others. Um, and to have that uh, verified, if you like, the data verified, and then that gets filed into the um, IMO database, which is uh, a confidential database. So what we had to do as the Poseidon principles was get to that data, but we have to get it from the ship owners who are our clients. So what we wanted to do was to apply that data to our loan portfolios. And we've chosen to take secured financing, shipping 80% of shipping finance is secured on ships. Um, and banks are the primary capital providers in the shipping industry. So our influence over um, over our clients, if you like, on this issue is, is, is much more significant than in any other sector. But what we didn't want to do was to, um, to make assumptions, if you like. We wanted the data to be simple to collect, so the ship owner is already providing that data to Flag State and ultimately the IMO, so they give us that data on the ships that we have a mortgage on. So it's an annual calculation. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, it's an annual calculation of called the annual efficiency ratio. And this data is fuel consumption and the type of fuel, the design dead weight of the ship, and the total distance traveled in that year. Now, there is another methodology called EEOI that is used more in Europe, which includes 
uh, it includes a calculation around the actual cargo carried rather than what, what the distance the ship actually sailed. And these two metrics, the AAR metric and the EOI, are likely to be combined by 2023 by the IMO as they go through the short-term measures they're currently discussing. But what this shows you is the blue line is the IMO's 2050 global trajectory to 50% cut in carbon emissions by global shipping. 50% not zero. Uh, and it is, if you like, made up of several different blue lines for each type of ship. So this represents the global fleet. And if you like, for each bank, it can represent their own trajectory. And these dots represent an individual vessel in their loan portfolio that is either in or out of alignment with the trajectory for that vessel. Now, these trajectories are effectively authorized by the IMO. They're provided by outside experts. And they are evolving with, with more studies. The fourth greenhouse gas study on shipping emissions was published a couple of months ago, and that's going to help inform uh, future, future data. Next slide, please. Um, this just shows, and I think Jamie showed some of this sort of earlier, but this just shows the trajectory on the left. The blue line would be the global fleet's emissions if nothing happened based upon forecasts of global trade. The 20 50 target is there and there are other reduction targets that have been talked about but i think the imo is going to revisit all those over the next uh, six to nine months including glasgow and hopefully come up with a zero ambition by 2050. next slide please so we take this the the, the measurement of this as i said we wanted to keep it simple so we get the data the data has been verified by a neutral and, and, and accepted advisor. ROs are uh, licensed or, or certified, if you like, by the AMO as, as being on their list. Uh, we take the data, we make the internal calculation, and then we disclose the alignment of our portfolio um, to, in comparison to the global trajectory. We do allow people to do this themselves, so the allowed pathways, there's an element of trust here between institutions doing this, uh, but because the data is the same data, that a ship owner will be providing to more than one borrower if they're in a syndicated facility, there's that trust we believe to be justified. And in the first year, which was last year of this, most people used some sort of outside advisor, but a few did do it themselves. Next slide, please. So we have disclosed, each signatory disclosed their climate alignment score publicly on the Poseidon Principles Association website in December last year and have included um, commentary in their various sustainability reports. So City published in December, I think also our ESG report, sorry, our TCFD report, uh, and last week our ESG or our sustainability report where there'll be references to uh, alignment with the Poseidon principles. We are just out of alignment. And what this particular graph shows is the two extremes, which are two slightly strange uh, lending organizations but the bulk of the lenders, you can see up top left, 1.2 average score. The, the signatories who were doing the reporting last year, about 50, 15 of us were just outside alignment. But we know that this, these trajectories are based on what is now out of date emissions data. So probably most of the signatories are close to alignment based upon where we expect the trajectories to be moved to. I think, um, next slide, please. I think um, important to stress that the Poseidon principles are the only climate alignment finance uh, framework that currently exists. And we were helped by the Rocky Mountain Institute and others under the auspices of the Global Maritime Forum. And if you go to globalmaritimeforum.org, you will find whatever detail you want on the Poseidon principles and the Sea Cargo Charter and the Global Maritime Forum. But that expert advice we had in bringing this forward was very important. We are now at 26 signatories, representing just under 200 billion of senior shipping debt, uh, representing around 50% of the outstanding debt to the industry. And if it had not been for COVID, I would have been spending a lot of time in China and Korea persuading those lenders to sign up, which we hope to achieve uh, during the course of this year. So happy to take any questions later, but let me hand back to Jovi to talk about the US context 
because with the Jones Act um, and, and cabotage in the US not being subject to the IMO rules, of course, we need to look at a, a different framework. Uh, next slide, Deb. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. So uh, the Blue Sky Maritime Coalition is a uh, nonprofit strategic alliance, which was formed uh, in the beginning of this year to accelerate transition of waterborne transportation in Canada and the US toward the net zero greenhouse gas emissions target. Um, why this coalition? Uh, the IMO, the greenhouse gas study number four recently published shows that about 30% of uh, marine, that is to say shipping, marine shipping emissions uh, are domestic. And so an inland and a coastal analysis and inland and coastal tools are essential uh, to review this uh, from what's really a unique perspective. International shipping assets, um, the life of a ship in international trade, which is what uh, the IMO and what um, Michael has been talking about primarily with Poseidon principles, has a, an asset life, a useful life of about 15 to 20 years. U.S. domestic shipping, uh, because of the Jones Act, uh, the useful life of shipping assets are 50 years. That's five zero. Um, so what can be done uh, and the approaches uh, for that uh, are very, very different, requiring different tools and a different analysis, all working toward reaching uh, the same goal. Uh, we're running late, so I just wanted to mention um, the uh, the members of the coalition include senior leadership from the entire value chain of waterborne uh, shipping, ship owners, operators, charterers, ship builders, fuel providers, engine manufacturers, the vessel classification societies, uh, port authorities, government regulators. Uh, academic and research institutions, uh, financial institutions like City and others, and investors, equity funds, and so on, um, NGOs, um, industry advisors, and others. Um, the initial uh, board uh, comprises uh, Kirby Corporation, Marsoft, Moran Towing, Shell, Washington uh, Maritime Blue, uh, those entities, as well as the American Bureau of Shipping and uh, Holland and Knight, uh, form the executive team for Blue Sky. So uh, I think with that, um, we can move on to questions in the next panel. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, the, two, the two of you. Um, we now are turning to the, uh, the, the panel discussion. Um, which will uh, include the uh, the speakers who have who have just addressed addressed you from aviation and shipping, um, but added to that uh, will be uh, several others. Um, and I'll introduce them now. Uh, Laura Rouse is the uh, is a partner at Holland and Knight in New York and Miami. Um, she leads the coordinates the green and sustainable finance uh, grouping uh, within Holland and Knight. She has a particular focus on energy and infrastructure uh, projects in uh, Latin, Latin America and has been uh, recognized as <clears throat> a leader in, in that space uh, in, in various circles. Um, she has been involved in a number of, of, of cutting edge uh, transactions, um, uh, most recently uh, the Fibra UNO uh, Mexico uh, Five Year Sustainable Revolving uh, Financing, um, as well as the uh, Stone Lake. Uh, uh, transaction uh, 144A Argentinian um, greenhouse uh, power generation project bond um, as uh, and um, will be sharing you know her experience in the power generation sector during our discussion. Um, we uh, have um, Stephen Humes and Mark Kaplan uh, both from Holland and I um, to contribute to real estate and related um, uh, aspects in our in our uh, panel discussion, uh, given that they uh, work in 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 this field um, not only in real estate but in a wide range of tra transactions. 
um, uh, Stephen um, practices and advises on the transactional uh, and the regulatory side um, across uh, the energy, public utilities, and infrastructure uh, sectors, and has been involved in transaction on conventional and renewable power plants, cogeneration, liquidified natural gas pipeline facilities, and 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 many others. Um, Stephen is uh, a partner in the in the New York office. Mark is a partner in the in the Boston office, and. Um, as well advises clients on the development and operation of energy infrastructure and natural resource still in projects through the United States and has been involved uh, in uh, in more in more transactions. I was printing out the uh, the prep for this, you know, um, you know page after page of, of transactions on wind and solar generation, renewable technologies, natural gas, um, um, both on the regulatory and, and the transactional side. So um, the two of them bring much to bear um, in, in this area. So we will now turn to, uh, to a, um, a Q&A type format. Um, Deborah, if you could come with the first question. Um, we um, only have 16 minutes left. I'm not sure how far we're going to get. We have others. Um, to the panelists, by way of heads up, um, after the first question or two, I'm going to bounce to the question about uh, about green and sustainably linked uh, uh, products. Question number five, by way of an advanced word. But but if I could sort of combine the first uh, the first two questions now to save time, um, so I'll I'll mention the first and the second, and then open the floor. The first question I'd like to ask everyone from their industrial sector perspective: To what extent is there a consensus or an emerging consensus on climate uh, change related targets, data assumptions and metrics, uh, and, and whether those targets are being met as a general, general statement? And the second question, uh, you know, what is the, the source of authority you know, for those targets? Are they industry-based? Are they regulatory? Are they disclosure-based? Are they driven um, by 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 law, by reputational issues, by other business uh, business interests. So the floor is open to to the panelists on this question. Okay. These questions. Well, Jeffrey, I'll I'll jump in here just because it it, it is an easy answer on on aviation. Yes, we do have a, an industry consensus on uh, aviation in general. Uh, the goals are uh, published and uh, and well. Uh, publicized by both IATA, uh, the organization that uh, um, aggregates the uh, airline industry, and uh, and ICAO and the, the civil aviation side, representing the rest of the industry as well. Um, and they're they're based on on goals uh, of reducing carbon emissions uh, of uh, aircraft technology over time. Uh, usage of sustainable aviation fuels uh, and uh, and other technologies, but uh, they're they're well established both on an annual basis, um, uh, with a target that has uh, so far been uh, not only met, uh, but um, uh, has been beaten. Uh, it was a 1.5 percent reduction per year, and the industry over the last 10 years has actually achieved 2 percent reduction per year. Um, so uh, the answer is, is yes. Let Thank me you, just come, let me come in very briefly on shipping, and then we can spend the rest of the time on the other sectors. The answer is also yes. I think the Poseidon principles methodology, which comes out of the IMO's regulations, has set the standard, if you like. And then what we have to do is to marry that with the financial standards that financial regulators, the Net Zero Alliance, Key Fans, and everything else, we're going to set. But hopefully what they will do is accept, at least for the shipping industry, that the IMO as a global regulator can set those. Now, one of the issues the IMO has on the positive side is it is part of the United Nations. It is in the power of the Glasgow Climate Change Conference to tell the IMO to set certain standards. The issue has been, if you like, the interference outside of cabotage countries by regional or national governments, in particular the EU, essentially wanting to set their own rules. And that drives at the heart of whether the IMO is regulating a global industry or not. That has to be resolved as part of that. But I suspect we will see 
uh, ETSs will see some sort of carbon pricing and then standards will emerge globally over time. Thank you. It's so good to look at the, you know, shipping and aviation as UN body driven uh, international by, by nature. Laura, Stephen, Mark, can you comment on things from your perspective on these questions? Sure, I'd be happy to jump in. Uh, and being a lawyer, I'd also be happy to say the answer to the question is yes and no. Um, so I can cover all my bases. Uh, I, I think Daniel and, and Michael are correct, is that there, there's a lot of emerging consensus on a voluntary, I'd call it, perspective with industry participants trying to come up uh, with their own standards in advance to address this issue. Uh, in, in my perspective, whether you're in the power generating sector or the real estate sector, for example, uh, the complicating factor is you've now got a number of governmental entities, whether it's individual states or potentially federal governments now that are beginning to develop and enact their own um, net zero or decarbonization standards. Those are taking many different forms, whether it's energy intensity, whether it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions from power generation, whether it's new building codes. And part of the difficulty I think here is trying to figure out where are those um, where are those new emerging requirements going? What will be the ultimate standards? And you know, how do you then track those standards and reflect them in financing documents or commitment documents going forward? Laura, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to piggyback off of what Mark said. I think that was a really good approach. And um, I, I think other panelists have spoken about some of the frustration or difficulties in, in nailing down hard targets across the different industry sectors. And in power generation, right, you have renewable sources as well as thermal sources. So even though I think people are thinking broadly in terms of carbon reduction, greenhouse gas emission reduction, when you look at the specific technologies and you drive into the, the industries more specifically, the same data may not, uh, data points and targets may not apply. But I think when you take a big step back and you look at, at a macro level, at a political level, at a country level, um, and so forth and so on, I think what you see emerge is a desire um, to have consistent reporting. And I think you see themes of, you know, looking for data, KPIs, metrics, whatever you want to call them, that are material that are fair and balanced and understandable, that are comprehensive, um, that are strategic and forward-looking, um, that are oriented towards the stakeholders that are involved and impacted by the industry, and that are consistent and verifiable. Um, and I know some of the other questions you had, Jeffrey, related to uh, the role that you know, third-party opinion providers and, and verification agencies play, and I think you see a lot of activity in that market, especially on the green bond and the sustainable finance side, um, because there is um, a, a need uh, for there to be a consistent, you know, uh, quality control check uh, when it comes to the green financing products. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Steve if he has anything else to add there. Right. So, and I'll just add, you know, while people are generally uh, looking for leadership in Washington and a consensus on the federal level, what we've seen in recent years and certainly in the last couple of years in several leading states and in most notably New York, um, we've seen the state take leadership with their version of a Green New Deal that has um, led to a significant uh, movement in the industry sectors, especially renewables, investing, and real estate uh, development in the state of New York. For instance, uh, the state's uh, clean energy standard has a goal of 70% energy generation um, from renewable sources by 2030 and 100% from renewable sources by 2040. And then the state has a, an economy-wide carbon neutrality target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from anthropogenic sources by 85% over 1990 levels by 2050, and uh, a plan to re offset remaining emissions uh, and an interim mandate of 40% by 2030. So we're seeing significant state policy 
that is implementing um, a lot of development, both it's gonna impact real estate uh, markets throughout the state and New York City development. And it's also impacting the um, activities of organizations like the New York Green Bank, which as of uh, December 31st had invested you know, $1.2 billion uh, to support clean and sustainable infrastructure. Um, it also, just uh, in terms of metrics, uh, I know, Jeff, that's part of the question. Um, the Green Bank is using the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol, which the U.S. developed through the DOE in cooperation with many other organizations and governments around the world. And that um, protocol is best practice, offers best practices for verifying results of energy efficiency, water efficiency, and renewable energy projects. Um, and it's useful to assess facility performance. Energy conservation measures are covered as well. Um, according to the Green Bank, um, they use the protocol to assess and verify energy and environmental impacts and assess the overall progress towards um, making transformation in New York in the clean energy marketplace. So I think that's an example of a metric in action um, and implementing the uh, state targets. Uh, turn it back to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. And if I can ask the panelists to put their phone on mute because we're getting a little bit of feedback here. Um, question number three, Deborah. Um, the, um, we talked a lot about financial disclosure. Um, I'd like you to, to, to comment on um, uh, without kind of go, going back into what we've covered, I'd like you to comment on whether the disclosure regimes that you've seen so far have been attracting more financiers or in a sense, you know, the reverse. Now, of course, it's, it's, it depends on the type of project, but, but um, are we seeing disclosure regime, regimes kind of bringing new investors in and increasing comfort levels generally? The floor is open. I'm happy to jump in on this. Um, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, the SEC issued a public statement last month inviting public comment on climate change disclosures. And it seems clear that the SEC is moving towards providing more guidance, uh, which builds on the guidance that was issued in 2010 uh, for public companies with respect to climate change disclosures. So I think it's fair to say we're gonna see much more action at the SEC level uh, on disclosures going forward. Others, have you seen, um, and it, well, if, if there are no further comments, we can move to another question, but, but um, these emerging regimes, I think they're, they're happening, they're clearly happening. And the question is, you know, how are markets, you know, are, are more investors coming in when there's more robust disclosure or conversely, is more disclose more robust disclosure, you know, um, uh, raising uh, issues for investors because of more granular understanding of the emissions footprint. Any comments on that? I don't. I don't know if I have a, a, a specific feedback on that particular question because I'm, I'm not an investment banker. I'm not out on road shows fielding questions from, from investors. So I'll defer to my colleagues on, on the panel. But I, I do think that there is tremendous appetite in the market for green products, green financial products. I think last year, um, the COVID pandemic, I think uh, further emphasized the need for sustainable and social products generally uh, to, to finance a recovery. And there's certainly been a focus on making sure that the economic recovery um, throughout various regions globally um, also include, um, you know, green infrastructure and um, continue a continued focus on uh, renewable energy as part of that, um, uh, you know, recovery. So I, I think the demand in the marketplace is there for green products. And I think there's been a very well established regime for green products through ICMA, through the LSTA, um, and through other leading organizations that, that govern 
the expectation of investors. So disclosure is important, um, clear data is important, verification of that data is important to get um, a, a project finance. So I'll, you know, I think that's, that's what I've and, seen and I think continues to be important. Yeah, well, that I could just chime in to, to that one and just add on it. I mean, I think we've seen a number of uh, renewable energy development companies, including some of the more traditional companies that have decided to switch into the renewable space, successfully issue green development bonds to support the development of, you know, a number of renewable projects, whether they're onshore wind, offshore wind, or various types of solar generation facilities. So as, as long as the metrics are in place, and, and I think the investors and uh, the sponsor uh, can agree on what the funds will be used for and what the measurement mm -hmm. protocol is, I think they can be very successful. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, um, a very clear um, history in transportation, especially uh, of looking to quality and companies trying to distinguish themselves uh, by safety, by quality standards. If you, you know, look back, um, I worked on the energy project at MIT as a lawyer very early in my career for a couple of years. Um, you know, at that time, about half of petroleum in the world was used in the transportation sector. It's a bit less now. Uh, but even so, uh, quality companies always try to, uh, to address concerns uh, in safety and in the environment. Um, the first double hull tankers was built by a Greek company, Ellison Corporation. There was no regulatory requirement for that, but they saw uh, that this was something needed and uh, moved accordingly. Well, thank you. Look, uh, we could just uh, comment briefly, Jeffrey. I think the other please. issue is the definitions. So to remove the political aspect of the EU taxonomy, investors are crying out for common metrics so that regulators, bank regulators, central banks, investors could all know what someone means when something is green, sustainable, whatever. Now, the fact is the shipping industry is not going to be green uh, for the most part until at least 2030 when zero emission vessels will go on the water and zero emission fuels exist. Aviation has other challenges simply because of, of you know, getting an aircraft up and keeping it up. Um, and so I think the acceptance of what is transition, which is where the taxonomy defines shipping as a transition industry, that I think will price capital and allocate capital. And then it will be for governments to decide what market-based measures um, can be used to support that in order to encourage the newer development. But the focus, particularly in shipping in the next five years, is going to be on lowering emissions. So it's not getting to zero. That's going to take a long time. It's visibly lowering emissions, and that's what investors want to see in the data, and that's why data is so is so important. Uh, uh, thank you, and I'll ask one other question. I'm really happy you made that point, uh, Michael, because, and I speak for aviation as well, uh, in the taxonomy, as you know, the, the real debate originally was, is something substantially contributing to, uh, to, to lower emissions, or is it a transitional activity? Or as Jamie said, is it best in class, or is it a momentum story? I think this is really where the action is going to be, based upon different different factors. Politics, of course, will will uh, will lead into this. So this is a uh, you know really the, the the critical space. Let me just uh, close with one final question, um, because the legal expertise we we have here. Um, uh, contract clauses. Um, are, are we seeing these issues permeate, you know, uh, uh, penetrate and permeate contract clauses? As, as Dan De Silva will know, for the first time ever in the export credit space ever in aviation, references were to ESG terms with financial impact for export credit. What are we seeing at the transactional level as far as the, the embedding of these concepts in contracts? Final question. So contract clauses are incredibly important in the financing context of uh, supporting clean energy projects or investments in projects that promise to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or uh, lower other uh, impacts in terms of carbon offsets. A typical deal would include conditions precedent to closing or, or drawdown and uh, the borrower uh, must be compliant in order to uh, be able to draw the funds um, and certainly certify that they're not in breach of these covenants. 
it's really important, not just at the fundamental level when it comes to the transaction, but oftentimes when we're dealing with say green banks or other uh, social impact investors, uh, they have their own import, uh, reporting and in the case of green banks, these are government financed entities where, where they're using ratepayer funds and they've, been, uh, they've assured the regulators that they would use these funds for reducing greenhouse gases or reducing uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption in, in energy. And so they have to report up to the regulators regarding the use of the investments that they've made in these, uh, in these loan transactions or equity investments. And so it's really important at the transactional level that, and we're seeing it more and more, that there are covenants and it would be an event of default for a borrower to not uh, satisfy the commitments that led to the transaction in the first place. Thank you. Any final comments from others on this, this question? Um, I'm sure that especially the sustainably linked ones, which are, which are predicated on this, um, you know, are, are central. Um, well, with that, as we are running, running over um, jam-packed program, I'd like to thank everyone very much. We'll be back in touch uh, with the, the date on uh, part two of this series. I thank all the panelists. I thank the audience, uh, University of Miami, um, on behalf of, of Holland and Knight. Um, a pleasure to do this. Um, I understand that when this ends, a survey will pop up on your screen. If that is the case, please uh, fill it out so we can uh, learn and improve as we move forward. So once again, thank you all very much for your time. Have a good rest of your day.